Welcome to Race Control. I've got Conrad Coleman here joining me. Because there is an unbelievable race going on, we're not going to waste any more of your time. We're going to go straight to the action. This is the arrivals here in Auckland, the end of leg six. And Conrad, just why is so much at stake? Just, just talk us through how close this finish is going to be. Well, it's... It's Auckland, mate. That's all you need to know. You know, as an Aucklander myself, I was born and bred in the city, and I grew up watching the stuff happen right here. And what a treat the current residents of the city have on their doorstep this evening. We've got Ax Nobel that has put in their final jibe to the finish. They've got two and a half miles to go as they round North Head, and this harbour has been the scene of so many dramatic moments throughout the history of the Volvo Ocean Race, and. As we go to a uh, helicopter image there, you can see the, the, the city lights and also... Ooh, I'm quite excited about this. You can see, see the lights of, um, of the Auckland City Harbour uh, just in behind. And this is going to be absolutely amazing. And this has been something that we've been building towards over the last couple of days. I mean, if you've been following the approach into Auckland, it, you know, the closing stages of this leg, you will know just what is at stake. Everything was spread out. There were only three teams that really had a shot at the top. And now, Team Axenabel, Sun Hunk on Scallywag have been duking it out on this last 80 miles into the finish. It would appear that Simeon Team Point has been able to build a little bit of a buffer here. I, indeed, with the miles ticking down, it looks like a little bit of weight has come off their shoulders on board Team Axenabel. Well, they are going to be looking over their shoulders and getting a whiplash as they, as they look behind them because they're staying a little bit slower now that they've come out of that jive. As they start to bury their way into the inner harbour, you, you go in behind North Head, in behind Mount Victoria. So there are two big mountains that are going to be blocking the wind and slowing them down. So they may have one mile advantage over Sunken Kaiskaroe right now, but it's going to be tighter than that at the finish. And behind them, I mean, we're staying with this front group at the moment, but behind them, of course, we've got so much more action to come. Turn the tide on plastic, Mafre and Dongfeng race team are locked together. Team Brunel some way behind, but we've seen this unbelievable compression here, so we are not ruling anything out. These are live images that we're seeing at the moment of Team Axonabel, and the breeze looks good, and the forecast, at least as far as we know, it's good all the way to the line. It's good all the way to the line. It's gonna be building, uh, building there. You can see that uh, strong breeze all the way down through the Rangitoto Channel, through the, these sort of celebrated sailing grounds that have been host to the Whitbread uh, around the world race, the Volvo Ocean Race, and indeed the America's Cup. And so the city is known for putting on a good arrival show. And we, yesterday I spoke with Grant Dalton, and, and he was sort of winding us back through the editions of the race that he's done. And he said that in previous years there were 250,000 people at the dock at 2 o'clock in the morning waiting um, waiting for these boats to come in. So these, these sort of ocean gladiators is something that's really, really appreciated by New Zealanders and indeed by Aucklanders. And it's early afternoon here in race headquarters in Alicante in southern Spain and in New Zealand. I mean, it is night time and it is just going to go into the wee small hours. But we have a lot of activity out there on the water following those teams in. Let's just have a little look at what we can see from these live images. We can see the stack. We can see that they're, they're double-headed. Uh, I'm guessing it's the masthead Code Zero up front. Then we've got what looks to be J2 possibly J2 up there as well. The stack midway. Uh, they're off the breeze, but the jockey pole is out on either side. So we know they've done some jibes. How confident are we that they don't have to jibe again? Because well, that pole's staying out. Mate, they're, they're, they're just using it for more leverage at this point, or, or just because they've got so much going on that they don't have the time to sort of pull in their, their little spiky bits out the side. Um, but no, they are lined up, they are locked on their course, and they have got the finish line in their sights. Chris Nicholson on the helm as we go to the 3D virtual eye tracker, and we can see the distance that Team Max and Abel have been able to pull out over Sun Hunkai Scallywag. They've just come out of a jibe, so we'd expect the speed to be a little bit down, and indeed now it starts ticking up to something resembling Team Max and Abel's speed. 
What can you tell us, Conrad, about the breeze as we get in here to the finish? Because the geography starts to close down a little bit. Well, it's incredibly fluky. You know, can, the, the, the primary built-up part of the, of the city is sort of down on, on their port side now. So that's the central biz, uh, business di district of Auckland. But on their windward side, that's the crucial side, there are two big mountains. There's Mount Victoria and, um, and North Head that they've just sailed around. And, uh, and then all of Takapuna and a big, big part of the city that is now blocking their wind. So that's why we saw them charging down the Rangitoto Channel at sort of 18 or 20 knots, all that they've done um, down from, down from Kauau, so the, the northerly islands that they've been sailing around in these last few hours. And now, well, it's not going to be a drift off, but certainly they are struggling a little bit for, for pressure. And a little bit of movement on board the boat. We can see the yeah. uh, the stay sail being filled up. Oh, we think that one's the J2. J2, yep. Uh, the masthead zero is still out at the moment. Is this going to be a little bit of a double jibe here? Uh, we'll have to see the angles on the tracker, but it may just be the fact that there's less pressure now and they're struggling to keep that masthead code zero pulling. You can see the, the angle of their sailing is actually quite low at the moment. They need to turn right or more to you know, head up a little bit closer to the wind. So I think it's just the fact that as the wind dies, uh, more sail up isn't necessarily faster. It's been really interesting as we've been watching the live images come from, from the whole fleet and indeed into this approach in Auckland. Just looking at those live images, how similar the sail setup or at least the sail selection has got throughout the fleet. Earlier on as we were, we were covering the races and the finishes into Lisbon and Cape Town, Boats will be approaching in different ways. Now, at least, it seems like a lot of those first instances where teams had got a little bit of advantage, a bit more knowledge, and maybe worked out a combination the other teams haven't got, things have leveled out. And maybe that's why leg six is coming down to just boat lengths on the water. Indeed, Team Axe and Abel, they're, if they're feeling confident about this finish, it's only been now. Sunhul Sky Scallywag is right behind them. It's only now less than a mile separating the two boats on the water. And I think you're exactly right. You know, these boats are one design down to the gram, the hull, the mast, the sails are all exactly the same. And so it has come down to the way that the teams have been using them. Remember, when we last, the, the, what you were just talking about there was at the end of leg one, going to Lisbon. Lots of teams were having very different approaches. Now we're at the end of leg six. We've sailed halfway around the world and 6,000 miles just on this leg. So clearly, I think that everybody has got got it all figured out and they've been watching each other on AIS and binoculars and so and drones all the way around the world and so I think that they've now got their their playbook pretty sort of locked in for the rest of the race. Uh, just just focusing there on the speed difference that we just saw on the previous screen uh, a big speed difference 18 knots for Sun Kai Scallywag 11 12 for team Axon Abel you were mentioning before you thought maybe that difference in wind speed having an effect certainly having an effect on speed well, well, yeah, but I don't think that that puts the, this um, multicolored boat um, in, in any danger at all. You know, they're closing down the miles. I, I reckon they're, they're sort of less than a mile to go now, uh, as we've got the commercial docks on their port side. Uh, they're really in the inner harbour, and so this is where it's going to get light and fluky. However, for those of you watching at home, this is the, um, going to be the race course for the import race on the uh, 10th of March, and so, well. I think they, they're going to be uh, pretty tired after the last, um, last 48 hours of boat-on-boat -boat contact, but to say nothing of the fact that they've been at sea for now 20 days and 9 hours. But remember, this is where they're, they're going to be racing uh, four points come uh, the middle of the stopover, and so they, they might might start thinking about you know, what the wind is doing here. I think a little chance to sail through the area is, is never one that you take lightly. Really interesting to see all the crew up at the moment and, and seems like they've, whatever they're doing right now, the boat's not struggling for power. As you say, they are ticking down the miles. They should be starting to feel confident. I don't want to jinx it because that's always something you're accused of whenever you start talking about a boat that's winning. But Team Max and Abel at this point, if they can cross the line, this is going to be their first leg win. First leg win, and, and this is a team that we've been seeing sort of rise in power. You know, famously they had so many, well, leadership and politics challenges. But before the start of the race, this was a team that uh, they declared uh, early in the race. So the first team to sort of stick their head up above the parapet and uh, to say, "Let's go for the Volvo Ocean race." Uh, they built a new boat. They had less time on the water than the others, so a bit of a different strategy from Dongfang race team and and Mafre. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been lots and lots of up and downs during the course of, of this race for this team. Uh, but, you know, they've, they've got incredible talent on board, a lot of experience. And, um, you know, if they, if they win this league, then they're going to be in, in real danger of, um, 
of, of taking more leg wins as the race goes on. And this has been a hard-fought leg win as well. I mean, it has not been easy for these two. Early on in the leg, there was some gambles involved. We have the time. We'll try and unpack a little bit of the winning moves that this team have done. But for now, just take our words that this has not been easy. It was not one single thing, and they've had to fight all the way. Indeed, this right now has been the biggest gap between them and second place that we've seen in the last 24 hours. I am, I, I know I get a little bit overexcited at times like this, but I am a little bit worried about these speed differences. We know that team, Axanabel, is very, very close to that finish line. Behind them, Sun Hunkai Skellywag, at least for now, in better breeze and closing down. Certainly the body language on board, though. They're not celebrating. They don't look too nervous. No, it's just interesting to sort of dial in and, and listen to a little bit of the onboard chat. You can see that they're sort of counting their way and not, no longer past the headlands of the north coast of New Zealand as they've been doing the last 24 hours, but dock by dock, pier by pier as they work their way into the inner harbour. Uh, they're you know, just clocking off the miles and the milestones. And I, I know that you're talking about the fact that Sunkunkai Skedewek is coming in fast, but you know, th this is a race that's done with, uh, with wind power, you know, so, excuse me for stating the obvious, but anything that's hurting this boat right now is going to hurt the next one as well. And so, you know, if they get into a sticky patch, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt the Aussies and, um, and the Hong Kong boat in behind as well. So, you know, I really don't think that these guys, um, guys and girls, are, are in any danger here. And they're now approaching um, Princess Wharf and Queen's Wharf, it is just a few hundred meters until the, uh, the finish line off the viaduct. And, and it's just so awesome to see the boat surrounded now by those little fairy lights. Each one of those lights on the water represents one boat and you know, 10 or 15 fans on board that boat. And uh, it's just fantastic that they're getting such a great welcome into, into a legendary um, ocean racing city. And we are expecting them to come across the line in the next few moments. They have got some breeze at the moment. They are moving forward. Sun Hunkai Skellywag closing down the distance, but it is too little too late. Team Axanabel are about to cross the finish line here and take their first leg win. Leg six, they had so much to do. They had so many attacks to fend off. And all the way right down to the finish, Team Axanabel striped and pushed their way through. And now Simeon Team Point they can include themselves in the list of leg winners in the Volvo Ocean Race. The breeze arriving now for Team Axanabel, the line right in front of them now. And Team Axanabel cross the line, winners of leg six, Hong Kong to Auckland. Oh, Conrad, the celebrations say it all. You know how hard a leg has been and you know how tough it was to hold it off all the way to the end when the celebrations are that good. I do, and it's just it's so exciting watching the raw emotion of this team that, that has had all of that building for them for so long. I, here in the studio in Alicante, you know, we're 19,000 kilometers away from, uh, from that boat that just finished, uh, finished the race in first place. And I've got the goofiest grin on my face at the moment. Just, I, I, I know what that release is uh, and, and just how exciting it is. It's a hard, hard fought victory. And it's not just this one leg that I've been battling. It's all the way since the start of the race. And just to give you an idea of how hard it been and how close it was all the way to the line, we're going to go straight to Sun Hung Kai Scallywag because in a few moments, David Witt and his crew are going to come through the line as well. And that little bit of slowing down in the breeze, that will have made Team Axanabel nervous, but it wasn't enough for Sun Hunkai Scallywag. At times during the last 12 hours, the distance between this boat that we're seeing now and Team Axanabel came down to 0.1 of a mile, but it wasn't to be. However, a second place finish now for David Witt after the win into Hong Kong. I mean, this boat has arrived. They're on form. Well, they're, they're very definitely on form. They won into their last... Um, into their home port, but let me just point out, you know, this is the only boat that doesn't have any Kiwis on board, and it's the one that didn't win the leg. So I'm sorry, no home team advantage for you, David Witt, uh, but incredible effort nonetheless, you know. Um, 
grinding them down to get into second place and to, uh, and to have done so with such audacious navigation all the way through the doldrums, that this is a team that has absolutely arrived in the Volvo Ocean Race and I'm excited to see more from them. And it's interesting to see some of the comments coming in on Facebook, some of, the, uh, some of you guys watching the show just talking about how this race, you know, 5,600 miles at the course, and it comes down to a few puffs of wind in the harbour. Make no mistake about it, these sailors know what it's going to take to win these races, and they will train for the roughest ocean conditions, and also these tiny meters that you have to get in the local geography when the effects really can pay. We're on board at the moment with Sun Hunkai Scallywag, a second place for David Witt as they come across the line. A great result, and at times, there was earlier times, 12 hours ago, maybe 20 hours ago, there some nerves. Mafre, Dongfong, the other boats really closing down as these two were, were, were becalmed, and David Witt was saying on the boat feeds, oh, you know what, first would be great, but I'll take a second. Well, yeah, absolutely. That, uh, that This is a team that really struggled early on, and so two back-to-back -back podiums, for, for sure, anybody would take that. That is absolutely incredible. And just sort of less than, tw than 24 hours ago, these two boats were, were tied together up at the North Cape, uh, Cape Rianga, uh, the northern tip of New Zealand. And, and actually, that was when Sung Hong Kai's getaway got back in touch with Axe Nobel, that the, uh, the Dutch boat had a big lead um, approaching that the North Cape and uh, they were a little bit too, sort of too offshore but going around that headland is notorious for really 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 uh, strong currents, strong counter currents sometimes and uh, you need to go uh, go right in on the coast to get uh, relief from the, from the counter currents. Uh, so the meeting of two seas, you've got the Pacific on one side and the Tasman Sea on the, on the other and so it's an incredibly challenging place to sail and that's where these guys got back in touch. And it really was an unbelievable last 24 hours and interesting to see how much it's had an effect of you guys watching here. We've had you know, Craig Murphy just commented, gutted for the Scallies but, but well bloody done for Team Axon Abel and I don't think that, that pretty much you know, that sums it up. But let's not forget just how important this I want to do the teams justice here. This change in what we're seeing in the positioning of the boats. Normally we've seen Mafre, Dongfong, the big hitters up the front. Whereas for this leg, Sun Hunkai Scallywag turned the tide on plastic, or at least until a few moments ago, Team Axe and Abel, they're vying for the lead. This is changing the overalls. If you are a fan of Sun Hunkai Scallywag, you will be very pleased, I think, about how the overall scoreboard is going to look at the end of this leg. We will be looking at it as the positions get confirmed, but one thing we can be sure, this leg will be one that we'll talk about. Well, absolutely. You know, it's, it's really brought these two boats back into contention uh, in the overall. Uh, Sun Kai Scaniwek now moving up into third overall and, and, uh, and looking pretty comfortable in that position as well. So, uh, but, but for me as a fan of this race, you know, uh, yes, I, I'm an ocean racing sailor. Yes, I'm standing in front of you now as a, as a commentator. But the, but the fact is, I am the world's biggest fan of this race. You know, I, I grew up in, in Auckland watching these boats come and go, and, and for me, I am you know, delighted by this. You know, turning the tables on, uh, on the two big favorites uh, is, is really fascinating. You know, coming into the, into the second part of the race where we've got more than double of the overall points still up for grabs um, is fantastic as these guys hit, hit their stride. Oh, we're just seeing on the stern camera there, Libby Greenhouse just uh standing by the uh, main the main winch and she's been really instrumental in this team. I mean, it's not never going to be one thing for sure. That would be uh, unfair to the rest of the team. But Libby Greenhouse jumped on board in the leg from Melbourne to Hong Kong, the one that they won. Now on this one, a second place. Whatever movement they've made, whatever lessons they've learned, they need to keep carrying this forward. Well, yeah, and I, and I think they will. You know, I think one of the strengths of, um, of this team is the fact that uh, you know, David Witt quite controversially at the beginning of, of the race when they announced, you know, he said, uh, I, I want to go around the world with a bunch of mates, uh, guys that I can trust, guys that I've sailed with over the, over the course of the, uh, my last few campaigns. And he has taken the, the core talent from his previous uh, Sydney Hobart campaigns forward into the Volvo Ocean race. Now, admittedly, they, they struggled. They thought that they were going to come into this race and blow the doors off everybody. And they've had some, you know, pretty, pretty humble you. moments. And, um, and, that, and they've learned a lot. But I, now I think that they've got the strength of the fact that they've got 
got that, um, that key group of, um, of members that they feel like they're a family on board. You and I noticed that, that they behave differently from the other teams. Uh, and so now that they've sort of got the keys to this boat, they know how to turn up the wick <laughs> and they know how to sail it fast. Uh, fantastic. I think they can be a real contender. A real contender indeed. I, I really do think that this is Sunhung Kai Scallowing. Uh, they have arrived again in this port and they are basically saying, look, we're going to keep pushing these boats to the front. And as you say, this world should put them in the third place on the podium, yet to be confirmed with the official results. But they have done an unbelievable job. The Shaw team are there for Sunhung Kai Scallywang, Team Axanabel. A handshake there between the two. A congratulations and a well done. Everybody enjoying just how close this battle has been. And the teams are now going to make their way into the docks. We are going to stay with us here. We're not going to come off because, fingers crossed, in just a few moments, we'll be able to hear from some of the sailors on the water. Plus, of course, there is still a big battle raging behind. We've got Turn the Tide on Plastic, Mafre, Dongfeng Race Team, all still to come, and then a little way behind them, Team Brunel. But do not rule anything out yet. Fans of Turn the Tide on Plastic might not be watching the result they want right now. However, one thing's for certain on this leg, it has been an unbelievable display of incredible ocean sailing. Uh, not, not a joke, I can't wait for the doldrums. <laughs> All my gear is soaking wet, so I'm looking forward to getting everything nice and dry and uh, kind of recharging the batteries. Trying to hook into that northerly breeze more than anything to come bows down back at the fleet um, and over the top of them, hopefully. For the first time, you make a really bad choice, I think. Not stoked to be in this position. Super long way to go, of course, but it's uh, fantastic to lead. Yeah, the Scullywags have had a very successful day. But we've got a lot of light air we're going to get through. And XL are only six miles behind, so. Yeah. <laughs> two boat runs. Two boat runs. Keep them rolling. Keep them rolling, son. Yeah. obstacle is really to go get out of the doldrums which will be near the Solomon Islands coming up and then hopefully we'll all kind of join up again and have another fleet restart that's probably the best thing that can happen for us at the moment It was quite obvious that uh, we actually were falling off the, off the pressure uh, from the three leading boats but they just keep sailing away keep sailing away yeah, Brunel uh, went in uh, stiff mode. Uh, I think uh, we are overtaking them. So, anyone's guess really what's going to happen. This is the top end of the North Island of New Zealand. Very light airs, pretty shifty, so it still could be anyone's race at this stage. Get them out of there and get them right on the bow. Get rolling now, we'll lock them out. Want to keep working them a little bit upwind? Still going forward a little bit on us there. Just relax, just drive the boat. Just chill it out. We just picked up a little bit of breeze, which is nice. Stressed, I'm not stressed out. It's, uh, it's going to be a long day, I think. Um, we can see the others on our bow, they're about six or seven miles away, so we're still trying to hunt them down. Let's see how we go. An unbelievable leg and Team Axonabal take the win and I believe now we can talk live to Skipper Simeon Team Point. Simeon, congratulations, a fantastic leg, well done. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah, no, that was a long one. <laughs> and just give us some idea of how fierce that battle was between you and Sun Hunkai Scallywag all the way to the line. 
Uh, it's been uh, it's been a 7,000 mile match race. It's it's, it's unreal. <laughs> I never did a race like this in my life. Basically, uh, from the start in Hong Kong, and uh, we were the only two that attacked uh, from Taiwan, and we always been in each other's sides. And then, uh, and then we finally fought uh, going into the doldrums. We had a bit of a leverage, but then uh, always pushing the last uh, 5,000 miles into lighter airs, and they were always there. And uh, so it's the last 16 days. It's been a neck and neck battle, and uh, huge respect for those guys. And uh, they never kept fighting, and we never kept uh, defending. And uh, unbelievable racing, and, and I'm unbelievable proud of the crew. And uh, they didn't flinch one time, and every time we managed to uh, just get that little more inch out of it. And a leg win for you, your first leg win of this edition of the Volvo Ocean Race. And obviously, you guys have had your uphill battles at the beginning of this edition, but you really found your form. Absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. It hasn't been an easy campaign at all. I mean, um, it's... <laughs> Sometimes I thought it was harder to get a campaign together, but now after this leg, maybe it's still harder to win a win a leg. But uh, no, it was it was hard, and, and uh, yeah, what a team I have, you know. It's 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 unbelievable how the guys worked, and 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 from the bottom points at the start, work our way up with a huge. It's a lot. You know, got some uh, some wise old men that always dare to give advice. Uh, Hans and and um, uh, and, uh, and and uh, he's always there by my side. So yeah, it was unbelievable that uh, everyone. It's a good team, and and, and finally we're showing off that uh, yeah that we can put a good result. And uh, yeah, it's a fantastic feeling. Oh, Simeon, thank you so much, mate. We'll let you get back to celebrations. Well done to you and your crew. Thank you, see you on shore. Well, Team Axe and Abel take the leg win, and I believe now we can go down to the dockside in Auckland. Amy Monkman is there waiting for the teams and soaking up some of the atmosphere. Yeah, thanks, Nal. I'm here with the Team Axe Nobel Shore Crew Manager, Bryce Ruthenberg. Bryce, was that or was that not one of the most intense finishes that you've seen in your career? Yeah, it was, especially after such a long leg. Uh, the boats were relatively close, but to be that close for the last day, coming down the coast was was uh, super close. Can't get much closer and, and happily we've come out on the right side there. And would you say that the team actually after such a long leg of six and a half thousand miles prefer it when it's a finish like that? For a bit of excitement or do you think they'd rather just sail in without Scallywag so close behind them? I think any team, if you're winning, uh, it's nice just to be one. Uh, maybe with a day or two to go and sail down in a 20 knot nor'easter down the coast of New Zealand, that'd be perfect. But uh, obviously it doesn't work out like that every time. And, um, you know, the guys are, are up for racing and that's what they do. So they're happy to race right to the finish line. And as a team, as a shore crew, I've, you know, we've just seen you come down to the dock. You've obviously been watching that all together. This is the first leg win for Team Axe and Nobel. How happy, what's the atmosphere like in the team right now? How happy are you guys? Uh, it, really good we're positive and um it's a big relief for us with the first half of the race we've had a few ups and downs inside the team and things are starting to come together and it's a big relief for the team they've deserved better results in past legs and haven't pulled it off so it's good to see everything come together and pull a good result off some might say that having such a good result so not late in the race, but halfway through. Is, it, is that too late for you guys to come back, or do you think that we're still going to see a lot more from Team Max and Nobel? I think we're going to start seeing more uh, consistent results in the top half now. And, um, you know, for me, no, it's not too late at all. The, the, it's a long race, and uh, things are just starting to get, get going now, you know. Some teams are going to start breaking a few things, maybe even us, but hopefully we've got a few of those things out of the way already, um, and we feel... We're in a good position and well prepared to take on the second half of the race. All right, thanks, Boris. We'll let you go and celebrate with your crew. That's all from us on the dock. Now back to you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Amy. And well, just as we were saying, we've got so much going on on the water at the moment, we don't really want to leave it for too long because we've seen Team Axenabel take the win. We've seen Sunukai Scaliway just behind them take the second. But as we pull back out, we can see what is at stake. It will be overall race leaders Mafre next to finish. That's going to be third place. But behind them, Dongfeng race team, and then turn the tide on plastic. Now, 
Conrad, this is going to be a little bit of a hard one for fans of Turn the Tide on Plastic, but so much has happened in such a short space of time. Well, you know, yes, you know, my, my heart has sort of sunk a little bit because, because, of course, you know, everybody loves an underdog here. Uh, but but to, be, to be fair, you know, they're still in the best position in the whole race. Best position in the whole race is certainly a lot still going on. We are going to be going back to Mafre. But before we do that, uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, Sun Hunkai Skellywag in just a moment. We're looking at the aerial shots right now of overall race leader Mafre. We know that the finish line is there in the gloom. It's lit from either end. And this was the position that Team Axe Nobel got that, that lighter patch of wind. And if you're Dongfeng Race Team, if you're Turn the Tide on Plastic, you'll be crossing your fingers that all of those things happen. So we're going to be keeping an eye on Mafre and indeed the two boats behind. But just before that, we're going to be hearing from uh, Sun Hung Kai Scallywag. They've crossed the line in second place. And uh, we can hear now uh, from the boat. Uh, we've got the live pictures there. And I believe that is David Witt uh, on the back with the headset on. David, congratulations on second place. I know you wanted first, but my God, you fought a good fight all the way to the line. Yeah, team, uh, uh, our team never gives up. Um, we just didn't pull it off this time. We uh, had our chances, um, but Axon O'Bell were were just a bit good. They had a couple of chances and they took them and we didn't, we didn't take ours and that's how it goes. But, uh, you know, we've come a long way from leg one. A long way indeed. And we were just talking here about how you're now surely seen as a serious contender for all the other teams. Very much a boat to be scared of. I don't know. You normally write us off, Niles. And you've done a 180, have you? Do you like your, your rating us now? I've always been a fan, David. I've always been a fan. I've always been a fan. I've always been a fan. Uh, OK. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know, we're, uh, we're mating the boat quite well. And, um, you know, the decision-making process with Libby and I is, you know, really good, working really well. So, um, yeah, I think, we're, uh, I think we're a chance of doing something a bit special. And just one last question, David, before I let you get back to your crew. That last 24 hours, I mean, it looked like such a brutal thing to have to go through after such a long leg, so tight, so close on the water. Yeah, um, I, yelled at him, I yelled out at him this morning and told him to, to get off the wheel because he's been punching me up for 20 years and he's still doing it. I've got to do something about it, seriously. I think, I think, I think Nico stayed on the wheel for a day. I don't think he got off. <laughs> All right, David, thank you so much. That just goes to show the intensity of your team. I'll let you get back to a very well-deserved warm welcome in Auckland. Well done. So Nunkai Scallywag across the line. That was skipper David Witt. Now it is the turn of Mafre. And interesting to see here the speed, 17 knots for the overall race leader. No dangerous slowing down so far. No, they're, they're pretty clean, and you can see that they, um, they're really pressed, so they've got uh, you know, a lot more wind than the first two boats when they came through these docks. Um, but, but remember, Shabby Fernandez knows these waters very well. For those of you who may be suffering from a little bit of a sense of deja vu, there was Mafre, the red boat that slipped through the darkness just a couple of years ago. They won into this, um, into this port, into Auckland. And uh, so they know these waters well, and they know what it feels like to taste victory. They are the overall, uh, the overall leaders in this race on points. And the thing that just has blown my mind is the fact that this red boat has just sailed past, turned the tide on plastic, and more impressively, it must be said, uh, Dong Fong race team. Like you know, they're, they're like a hot knife through butter at this point. You know, they, they they came uh, past the North Cape. Uh, behind Dongfong race team and then as they work their way down the northeast coast of New Zealand from Kepirianga all the way down well they, they they knocked off their biggest competitor in the race overall and then they they took that final scalp uh, just as they came past Kowal in, in these last few hours so really impressive these guys are the overall leaders and it's 
pretty clear as to why. And also, I think really crucial to point out, as you say, they've managed to tear their way through the field and get a very good result third on the podium. This is a good finish. But their main rivals in the overall scoreboard, we've got Dongfong Race Team safely behind them. And also Vestas 11th Hour Racing, the third in the podium going into this leg. But they are not on the water racing. They're actually on the hard at the moment, getting some repairs. Their plan is to rejoin the race, hopefully. Uh, things are on track. Uh, to rejoin the race before the import racing in Auckland. But this has been a good leg for Mafre in all of those regards. They didn't perform that well, but for them, their closest rivals weren't performing either. Well, well, yeah, one of the things that, that we were sort of constantly debating in, uh, here in Alicante was whether Dongfang race team and Mafre were match racing themselves sort of out of contention, that for a long time they were out the back of the fleet completely. Uh, but you know, keeping a very, very close eye on each other. And they've got the buffer uh, on the points to be able to do that. And this is the finish line now coming up for Mafre. We are on board with the overall race leader and it is a third place finish in leg six. And if the last time that you dialed into the Volvo Ocean Race was 24 hours ago, you will be incredibly confused as to what you are seeing here. The Spanish team was 50, 60 miles back. I mean bigger deltas than that earlier on in the leg as well and then in the last 24 hours in the last 12 hours everything has gone inside out in that middle group Mafre have sailed past turn the tide on plastic and in to third place and that is what the celebrations are all about because so many people didn't think that was possible I didn't think that was possible well no we're out the back and, and I remember in the middle of this leg that when we were looking at the um, at the virtual eye tracker I remember seeing this boat 281 <laughs> miles <laughs> You laugh now, 281 oh. miles behind Team X Nobel. And so it is frankly astonishing that they, they kept their nerve, they kept their eye on the ball, that they motored the boat really, really well. They stayed in really good pressure. And as you, as you say, you know, they, they came back 150 miles back in the last 36 hours. Uh, and, they, and they did that by sailing in better wind. But more crucially than that, even in the same winds than the other boats, because we, we saw earlier in the day, if you, those of you that are watching the raw wall on, on the website saw them just, just sail past the other boats in the same conditions. Well, let's go to the other boats and see what conditions they're in right now, because just behind Mafre is Dongfeng Race Team. Just behind Dongfeng Race Team is Turn the Tide on Plastic. And I know that that is a very... A depressing thing to hear if you're fans of Turn the Tide on Plastic, and I don't believe that there is a soul in the world that didn't want to see Di Kafar and her crew finish in third place. But sadly now we know that that is not the case. Mafre have taken third. Dongfeng Race Team are about to take fourth and Turn the Tide on Plastic are going to be behind them. And, well, Charles Cordrelia will be pleased that he has managed to stay with the Spanish team. He'll be pleased that they managed to turn a fifth into a fourth, but he still needs to find a little bit of an edge over the Spanish boat. Yes, but in many ways, th this is sort of job done for, for Charles and, uh, and Dong Fong race team. Coming out of Hong Kong, he said that this was the leg of the, of the rest of the race that he was most afraid of. This was the one that he felt could sort of turn the time, uh, <laughs> turn the time on plastic, <laughs> <laughs> turn the tables on them. Because if Mafre had won this leg and Dong Fong race team had been out the back, that would have been an enormous mountain for them to climb in the back half of this race. So yes, they've dropped one more point here. Uh, but it is only one more point because, um, because uh, Mafre did not win the leg. They didn't get that bonus point that, that, um, that Charles was so afraid of. So in many ways, you know, this, is, this leg was all about damage limitation. They've done that. They can get home. Now they can focus on the big leg to come, which is Auckland Itajai via the famous Cape Horn. Well, Dongfeng race team going through the finish line just behind overall race leaders Mafre. This sees them cross the line in fourth place, stealing the positions that should have been turned the tide on plastic. The Kafari will be next to cross the line. But as you're saying, I mean, Charles Cordrillia and the team on board, it is, has been job done. And in fact, if you've been seeing the boat feed over the last week when they were so far behind the front runners, there hasn't been despondency. There hasn't been a drop in morale because they've known, well, the only boat that we're really focused on right now is Mafre, and we've got them right next to us. Exactly. You know, there were six boats out on the water, but there was one that they really cared about. They had enough uh, points the, to secure themselves in second place, even if they were way, uh, way down the pack. Uh, and so all they needed to do was, was keep the red boat uh, on the horizon, either in front or behind them, 
Uh, this morning it was behind them, and this evening, as we, as we can see, um, Mafre was in front of them. And so, uh, so yes, job done, damage limitation, all that we've said in terms of the overall picture, but still watching Mafre sail past them earlier in today as they went down, uh, down the coast must have been brutal. And look at this reception for Turn the Tide on Plastic. We still have Sun Hunkai Scallywag, Team Axon Abel, Mafre, Dongfeng Race Team, all on the water just the other side of the finish line. And now Di Kafari and crew, a, a, a young crew, 50-50 male, female, and half the crew under 30, 13 knots of boat speed as they come into the finish line. They are they are just minutes behind their, their well-deserved third place. This is not a result that's fair. Indeed, David Witt, uh, you know, 12 hours ago, said from the boat, there's no justice in the world. You know, how is it that Mafra and Dongfrong managed to get themselves back into it? But that is what happened. And now Di Kafari has seen all those thousands of miles of hard work come down to the last 50 and turn the tide on plastic as they cross the finish line with arguably a good finish compared to some of their previous numbers, but they've been leading this leg. They had been leading this leg, and it's very easy for us to try and uh, put a spin on this here in the studio, uh, but, uh, but they've been, as you said, in the lead on this, on this leg. They have been in third place for the past five days or so. They thought that they had their hand or, or their, their foot on that bottom step yeah. of, of the podium. This yeah. was theirs. But again, you know, the, now that they've finished the line, they, uh, they've finished the leg, they are across the line. They're going to furl up the sail. And they, uh, the, you know, the pressure that they have been under is going to fall from their shoulders. And admittedly, they might be upset with, um, with the way that these last few miles have, have gone, getting the two boats past them just in the last couple of hours. But frankly, first place to turn the tide on plastic, that's a big step up from where they were, especially in the fact that they're coming in in the fumes of the two best boats in the race. Well, I, the, well in the comments here, Roger Buckle just wrote, uh, you know, what a cruel result for turn the tide on plastic. They will be, uh, you know, they will be shattered. And, and I think, you know, we could sugarcoat this and we could mention the fact that there were times in this race where they outpaced, outpaced by days, uh, Mafre and Dongfeng Racing, the two teams that have had the speed that the other ones have been aspiring to. But I don't think Dee Kafari would want us to sugarcoat it. She's always been somebody that's been quite stark and always said, no, this is what it is, this is what I need to do. And this is a boat that could be satisfied with finish at, at the back. And they have done an environmental message and they've talked about getting uh, young sailors in and, and having 50% uh, male, female. They've given themselves the targets. But on top of that, they're not satisfied if they underperform. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of the fans have been really enjoying Turn the Tide on Plastic. They, they finish a leg, you say to Di Kavari, oh, well done. And she says, what do you mean, well done? I didn't yeah. win. And yeah. I like that spirit. Yeah, I, I love it. And uh, I, I think those, those, of, uh, those of you watching this right now will clearly pick up on the fact that we're sort of partisan favorites for this blue boat. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. But um, you know, just, just think about how far they've come. Yes, she can be a little bit grumpy about, about getting rolled by two boats in the last miles. I would be, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, and I know that you would, would be too. But uh, I think that this puts them in good stead. You remember on... On leg three, going through the Indian Ocean, then Di Kafari felt the weight of responsibility, taking all of these young nippers into the Southern Ocean, uh, that she was afraid to you know, basically have their lives in her hands. Uh, and so just think about how far they've gone, even from uh, the middle of leg three to the end of leg six now. So again, uh, as an ocean racing sailor myself, I know what it feels like to be sitting in New Zealand facing down the Southern Ocean. It's a place that I love because that leg is really spectacular. Um, but I think that she can be looking forward to that leg knowing that what it feels like to be at the pointy end of this race and knowing that she can take it to the bigger teams. Well, let's talk a little bit uh, uh, about this sort of new situation that we're finding ourselves in because obviously six legs in, as we were talking before, it is one design and a lot of the teams who got their boats early uh, and did a lot of early training and a lot of early work really benefited from that early time on the water, working things out. Now it seems like those advantages have been shared amongst the fleet. It is now the gap has closed. Turn the tide on plastic have worked out how to go fast. Dong Fong don't have that advantage. Mafre don't have that advantage the whole time. And I think going forward into the rest of the race, 
all the teams are, are sort of contenders. I mean, even turn the t uh, um, Team Brunel, who we saw really hemorrhage miles in a heartbreaking way in the last sort of 48 or three days, shall we say. They, at the beginning of the leg, we were talking about them finding a new lease of life. The speed was there for the first time. They were outpacing the front runners. So, well, there's been so much to go on. There's been so much to talk about, but we really want to hear from the sailors as well. So we have got uh, Charles Caudrelli, I believe, on board Dong Fong race team and an unbelievable leg here. And I think we're going to be able to hear from Charles Caudrelli in just a moment. We're hoping that we're going to be able to bring you a bit of Dika Fari and turn the tide on plastic as well. But there was so much at stake, not only on the finish line here, but also the overall scoreboards. We are waiting to hear from those skippers, and not least from Team Brunel. I mean, you talk about a, a boat that needs to find a little bit of pace. This result, this position of the water, does not adequately reflect actually how hard Bauer Becking has been pushing that team and how well they have sailed. It was one slip up. But uh, that's the thing that I always say when it comes to, to ocean racing, in particular, uh, the navigation is the fact that you, every, no individual moment will win the leg, but any individual moment can lose the leg. And that's why uh, the navigators are in the hot seat, you know, sweating buckets, not only because they're going through the doldrums, but there's so much pressure to get it right every single time. Well, that is Dong Fong Racing that we can see there. Charles Cordrelia on the back with the headset on. Uh, Charles, uh, that was an unbelievable finish. So close, so many positions coming down to those last few miles. Just give us an idea of what the relief is like to be across the finish line. Uh, yes, yeah, so first thing at the end was uh, down the tide on my free. Uh, yeah, but I'm not... Uh, not very fair for Tom the Tide, who did a fantastic uh, leg and uh, finished uh, five. I don't think they deserve this place, but uh, I've been uh, very unlucky today and we managed to come back. Uh, Charles, give, give the fans of the race a, a little bit of a chance to understand something here, because the big question is, there was a point where I believe it's legitimate to say that you and Mafre felt like the front runners were just too far ahead. Is that fair, or did you always think that this was going to be the situation? So, repeat, sorry. I'm wondering whether you thought that the race was won and lost, or did you know that the weather conditions this close to Auckland were going to mean that maybe third, maybe fourth was possible? No, I think uh, we, have been to, uh, we had a good surprise this afternoon. Uh, the guys are very... We no wind during a long time, and uh, we were offshore, and... Uh, uh, that kind of situation, uh, like it happened at the start of the leg, actually, because uh, Axel and uh, Scaliwag uh, did a very bad start, and uh, by doing a bad start, they were in good position for the, for the future. And after they said, "Well, but uh, it sometimes happens. You are you are red, and you can you are. I think they were red, and with the wind, the wind pushed them to the coast." And then suddenly it stopped, and we arrived uh, back, and we were offshore, and we had wind offshore. The wind was coming from offshore. We have been very lucky, uh, but uh, that's that's racing, uh, that's sitting. Sometimes it's like that. Sometimes you need luck. Oh, Charles, I certainly agree. I think this is going to be one of the leg finishes that we're going to talk about for years to come. I will let you get back to your team. Welcome to Auckland, and uh, well done for a very hard-fought leg. Hey, bro. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so we are now watching scenes of Team Axinobel jubilation as they come into the dock and a leg victory, their first leg victory in this edition of the Volvo Ocean Race. And this is a team that has been through a lot. There's been question marks as to who the skipper was going to be early on in the race. They really moved around a lot of key players on the boat, on the team. However, they now seem to be settling into their groove and certainly on this leg, a bold decision early on paying off. I mean, Charles talked about it there. They did make a big move. They they did, and, and for those of you that, that maybe right, didn't remember that, they, they came here. out through the, the South China Sea, Simeon. and as soon as they nice. had uh, Taiwan on the left-hand side, they hung a left, they went up to Japan, basically, sailing directly away from the finish line. Well, let's hear yeah, from the here. skipper himself now on the dock. Yeah, I thought the whole race was intense, but the 20, last 24 hours were, uh, were the maximum. No, it was unbelievable. It was, uh, I think, close to a 6,500-mile or 7,000-mile metro. 
huge respect to Scallywag. I mean, they gave us <laughs> the battle of the century, and and then uh, even this this morning, you know, we had a couple of lead changes, and uh, yeah, unbelievable crew work. I'm unbelievable proud of the crew, and they did such a fantastic job, and we managed just be uh, one and a half mile in front and uh, finish the leg almost in uh, in the same uh, distances that leg in Hong Kong. Just uh, unbelievable feeling. And it's a great result. The first win for the Dutch boat, the first win for you as a skipper. It's amazing work. And uh, are you going to take this forward for the rest of the race? Yeah, that's the whole idea. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's been a, gr a good build-up. I mean, uh, we had a bit of a rocky start and uh, and, and, and uh, everyone in the team has had a vision and, and always was so motivated to do well and working with each other. And uh, then to have this, uh, even also in Auckland, you know, like the sailing capital of the world. Yeah, it's like a crown, you know, uh, on, on the hard work that's been done. But 60% uh, of the race or 55% of the race still has to be done. So uh, it's a good booster and gives confidence and hopefully we can uh, continue. Well, congratulations, mate. You thoroughly deserve it. Ladies and gentlemen, your winning skipper, Simeon Tienpon. Oh, Conrad, I think that that, that grin from Simeon Tienpon, that's a smile as big as a harbour. I think he's pretty pleased with himself there. Congratulations. You're the first Kiwi in. How does that feel? It feels great. It's amazing. Thanks, Kizzy. It's good to be back. Obviously, you're battling against uh, a couple of your close mates. And uh, how was that battle out there? Yeah, we battled more all the way to the finish. And um, yeah, saw your old fella and Chuggy out there um, just this afternoon. And uh, luckily, we got to sneak away from them and get in here. And... At the top of our New Zealand, you said, uh, you know, the pressure was on you guys being at the front. Was it uh, pretty nervy on the boat? Uh, no, you... Yeah, OK, it was. Uh, <laughs> We were, the pressure was on. Uh, people were getting pushed all the way through the end, as you saw from Skellywag, a mile and a half behind us at the finish. So, yeah, all good. Mate, it's awesome. You guys pushed hard. You got the win. Thoroughly deserved. All right, ladies and gents, one more time for your leg winners, Team Max and Nobel. <laughs> Brad Ferrand on board, Team Axel Nobel. And I really, I mean, this, this, this celebration, these smiles, they're infectious, you know, and it is the first time, and it's so nice to see a break in the form, not let Mafre, not let Dongfeng race him just run away with it. We've got a yacht race on. Exactly. There are some pretty gnarly beards on board that boat, but some big smiles in there, and clearly well-deserved. But the sweetest face that you're going to see today <laughs> is that one right there. It's so good to see these sailors reunited with their friends and family after an incredible hard four leg. It all came down to the finish. But let's not forget, Team Axonabel made some very bold moves early on. <laughs> we need to get more snacks, get, get the motivation up, that's for sure, that's probably one of the bigger. Uh, we're now sitting in second, just like a half a mile off first in the last skip. We're in a good spot, obviously, it's a massive way to go. It's good, it's cool. Lights off when the mic's on, now it's my song that we ride on. Time's up, yeah, the time's gone, let the bygones be the bygones. Lights off when the mic's on. My song that we ride on Time's on, get yeah, it, time's on Let the bygones be the bygones To win the race, you need to win legs, that's for sure and I hope this leg six, we, uh, we end up uh, well
Oh, there we go. An unbelievable leg through the eyes of Team Max and Abel. And you know, Conrad, it hasn't been a leg with some of those big wow moments in terms of a huge crashing waves or, you know, the man overboard that we saw from Sunan Kai Scallywag. Mate, I'm just going to interrupt you there because I, I know that they've already been down in the, in, the, in the Southern Ocean, but remember earlier on in the league when they were in the middle of the Pacific and they just had that, that cold front roll over them, there were some pretty burly manoeuvres. And, and actually, Simeon Tenpong got washed off, uh, got washed off the wheel, few but through... Uh, a few bruises there, and actually, we spoke earlier with um, with Blair Took, who talked about the fact that that um, those conditions that they had, maybe for only 12 or 24 hours, were actually tougher than the Southern Ocean, the Indian Ocean. Oh, well, I don't deny that it wasn't tougher because certainly you saw some of the sailors towards the end, of the last few days, when the intensity was still up. Normally, you'd expect that little bit of a stringing out of the fleet, but with the boats so close together, there was no chance for rest. There was no chance for a little bit of letdown, and it hasn't disappointed in terms of some of the tactics. And I'm just hoping whether we can have a little bit of a look now at how the leg has played out in a tactical, in a strategic way, and whether we can just replay now the virtual eye tracker of how this leg was won and lost. I mean, it started off in Hong Kong at the start line, and I mean, the start was not extraordinary. The wind was a little bit down, but it didn't disappoint. You've got 5,600 miles to go from Hong Kong all the way to Auckland, and right the way from the line when the gun was fired, we actually saw, what, some distances build up. Well, absolutely. You can you can see that Mafray sort of rolled over the top of Turn the Tide on plastic right there, and they forcing them to sort of tack off, and then way out the back of the fleet immediately. And so, again, fans of Turn the Tide on plastic did not have a good time as they went across the South China Sea. But then into that night they went, they got back in touch with the fleet, which was really impressive. Brunel were out leading and, uh, at this point, and then off they go. They turn left and... Ax Nobel and Sung Kai Scallywag, first and second overall in this leg, were in last place. And that's what, uh, what really sort of wound up the pressure, both on them and on their fans. However, as they went across the Pacific, um, the, finally their position out the back of the fleet allowed them to play uh, this, this cold front a little bit differently and avoid the park up that hit the front of the fleet. That was a park up and it really did have a little bit of a dramatic effect not least with Mafre and Dongfeng Racing, because this is where, shall we say, some of the shenanigans with these two teams in the light patch started to go, and they just never really let go of each other. They never let go, and neither did, did Ax Nobel and, and Song Hong Kai Skywag. These two uh, were sort of on each other's hip all the way through the doldrums and really stressful sailing. Um, but actually, they may have given each other a gift in, in that way of, of ratcheting up the pressure as they went through these really challenging conditions. This was the bit where, where Team Brunel decided to put it all on black. And uh, they, they went into stealth mode. They said, OK, let's go go do something different. You can see in this anti-cyclone here in the middle of the Tasman Sea, there are two routes to Auckland. Go straight, but upwind, or you go down with the southerly option where you stay fast and have to sail more miles, though. But this was such a, this would all happen in the last few days, and it would make such a dramatic effect on the overall scoreboard. Team Brunel here really suffered. And, and this is where... The last time that the race looked, shall we say, normal before some of the craziness began just on the northern tip of New Zealand. That's right. You can see as they approach Cape Reinga, well, there's that anti-cyclone that just sort of sits on top of them. And that's when Sung Kai Skadiway got back in touch that uh, Ax Nobel got really, really hammered there, a little bit offshore. And you can see uh, Turn the Tide on Plastic right in there on the beach enjoying... Uh, you know, maybe grabbing some sunscreen off the um, off the beach goes as they went. But then, as they go, uh, as they approach the sort of Bay of Islands, all of the top hits of uh, of the tourist New Zealand, you can see that they have no time to enjoy the sights of this beautiful country because you've got the two red boats charging back into the midst. And now we find ourselves in Auckland with another new leg winner and a little bit of a movement on uh, the overall scoreboard. Let's take a look at some of the numbers that have been coming off from this leg. Let's have a look at some of the statistics. A big comparison here between Team Axon Abel and Sun Hung Kai Scallywag. That is first and second placed finisher. So, Conrad, what jumps out? Well, first off is distance sailed. For a team that finished basically less than one mile apart, you've got more than 200 miles uh, sailed by Team X Nobel, and, and in many ways, that's proof of the fact that these uh, these far yacht designed um, 
Volvo 65s are really quick when you power them up, when you sail them in the right way. So in many ways, it's worth sailing more distance if you can sail in the right pressure and at the right angles. And looking at average speed, fairly similar, a little bit tipped towards Axon Abel and the number of tacks and jibes, again, quite similar. And all of this really showing that, as you say there, when we were looking at that uh, virtual replay, they locked in together fairly early on in the leg and then they pretty much stayed together all the way. And that is why we have just been treated to an absolutely un believable finish here in Auckland. What you can see from the helicopter there, that is the race village. Now we are down on the dockside with the supporters of Sun Hunkai Scallywag waiting for the boat to get onto the shore and we're going to be able to hear from the sailors as they come in and just soak up a little bit of the atmosphere. Don't forget that going into their home port in Auckland, Sun Hunkai Scallywag won that leg and won it in dramatic style. They were 100 miles in last place but they had enough time to overhaul that and, well, by hook or by crook, by luck or by judgment, I know what David Witt will say, but they <laughs> certainly did what the other teams didn't and managed to get themselves through. And so while we're just waiting for David Witt to come up onto the pontoon here and be reunited with his shore team, friends and family, let's take a little bit of a look at what he was able to do on the water in leg six. Actually, we should sign him up here. Honestly, Mark, Olympic Go, go! I'm your speed, super fast and go. Got your knees, 20 G's to roll. My big roll was both. Every single step, nothing less than original. Whoa, see, it ain't hard to find. Sparks on the roof, running across your mind. Beaming, lights on a right on a demon. Leaving the punch over, no more breathing. Seriously, wait, never seen boats like this. I must just to win It's us against them And trust we don't bend uh, But it don't take much See I got the minus touch Yep, don't think clutch with a rush Like a hundred thousand kilowatts Straight to the brain On a plane that will never drop The luck of the draw really The grid file said that the other guys Would fall into a big hole And once we've made the decision To go up there Based on the grid file The grid file changed So the way grid files work It's Fagazi, right? Fagazi. It's not real. The rest of the fleet are literally hundreds of miles behind. It's probably a little bit early days for the two red boats to think no one else in the race has got a chance. But time will tell. An unbelievable leg from Team well, Sunhunkai Skellywag, second place. And you know, oh, Conrad, how much has changed in a few months here? I mean, we are watching some beautiful scenes here on the, the dockside for Team Sunhunkai Skellywag just to arrive in a few moments here. The supporters start young for this team, but Conrad, I was just thinking, you know, watching that little bit of a recap here. How much has changed since the start of the race when Sunhunkai Scallywag weren't really, I mean, they were an outside, they were an outside contender in the eyes of many. And while David Witt will bonk at that and really sort of fight back from it, I think that's a position that he likes to fight from. I don't think he wants to be part of the, the front runners, the mainstream, the big hitters. I think he likes being the underdog, punching up from below, and he's shown he can do it. Whoa. Very definitely. He's shown that he can do it, but uh, I think he'd be quite happy if he was sitting at the top step because uh, he, he certainly had a big smile on his face when, when they were in that position in, uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, and now again on, on the second step of the podium. So this is a team that, that came in with um, you know, very little Volvo Ocean Race experience. That When we were uh, assembling the, the statistics on all the teams, they were very light on experience, uh, particularly with this one design boat, despite the fact that they had previous winner um, uh, Luke Parkinson on, on board who, who brought all of the experience of um, 
uh, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing, and in fact, the boat that they have now is the the former Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing. And so, sort of getting back into the swing of things, this boat is finding its feet and getting uh, sort of back towards the podium. Um, but I think that. Um, the, the fact that they struggled early on was indicative of the fact that the Volvo Ocean 65 is very different from the Maxi that the team has, uh, has often been sailing. Uh, also, remember, the, the race that, um, that David Witt is known for is, is not only the, uh, the, the Nokia 18-foot uh, skiff in, in the Bay of Sydney, but also 100-foot you know, Maxis on a 600-mile sprint down, down the Australian coast. As we know, this is a 6,000 mile leg, it's 10 times that, and as you said, it's one of the most, uh, well, well, one of the least remarkable legs of this entire race. And so, uh, you know, it was a big change of pace for this team. Uh, they had you know, big, big learning to do, and, uh, and clearly they've, they've been able to do that. They've been able to do it, and they've done it twice now. A win on leg four into Hong Kong, now second place from Hong Kong to Auckland. There we can see Sun Hung Kai Scallywag just lining up for the reverse into the top. Oh, it's just beautiful scenes of everybody waiting now to be reunited up on the dock. We're going to be able to hear from the sailors themselves while they get in. And all this is happening at the race village in Auckland. And if you're lucky enough, get yourself down to the race village. You'll be able to see the boats up close and personal as well as the teams as well in their team bases. And of course, don't forget, there's going to be plenty of pro-am racing before we get to the scoring, import races, and the leg and it start a beautiful day. Two in about two or three weeks' row. time. Here they come. Give it up for Sun Hunkai So Sun Hunkai Scallywag, second place on leg six, coming into the dock. Let's join the atmosphere on the dock. <laughs> Let's hear it, ladies and gents. 6,000 nautical miles all the way into Auckland, New Zealand. Just getting the shorelines back onto the boat, very delicately parked indeed. It's amazing to see the tension on some of the sailors' faces they're parking the boat. All they want to do is just celebrate, get to shore, but they know the race keeps going. They've got to take good care of their boat. We don't want to muck it up when we're parking it, do you? And not in front of the, the, the media, all the race fans and everything. And of course, live on air as well. Do I get a kiss? I, I, I heard the ordered rapists, I thought, I know that voice. I saw the fly by like this. Hello, darling. Hello. Uh, just before we get an interview here with David Witt, that was quite interesting, Conrad, because he said, oh, I saw the flyby, and we might have a little bit of an idea as to what they're talking about there with uh, their owner, Mr. Lee, and, and right, his plane. And gents, I'm here with the second place finisher, David Witt. Mate, it was a fantastic race. Talk us through that last 24 hours. And for you guys, it's momentum. Another podium finish. Yeah, yeah, good for us. Uh, didn't feel like 24 hours. It felt like three weeks like that. We were next to him off uh, Japan, Taiwan. Never got away from him. So, But the boss is here. And uh, he told me he'd come down if we won, and we didn't win. So I'm about to face some music, I think. Uh, it looks like he's got a smile on his face, and the team looks to have smiles on their faces as well. You guys have got the momentum. How was the feeling on the crew? Oh, yeah, really good. Um, we never give up. Uh, we're still trying right to the end. We're only, uh, I think, uh, about 15 minutes out. We're only a couple of boat lengths away. So, um, you know, we uh, had a couple of opportunities that we didn't take, and, you know, hats off to Axe Noble. They sailed really, really well. We, we put out much pressure as we could on for three weeks, and they uh, they stood strong, so uh, they deserve the win. It's good. It's good they got a win too. So very good. Awesome. Well, congratulations again, mate. Well done. A second podium finish. Good stuff. David Wick giving his congratulations to Simeon Team Point and the crew of Team Axe and for just pipping him at the finish line.
And now that's two boats on the dock in the race village in Auckland after completing leg six first and second side by side. And we can go back to the dock now and we can hear a little bit more from some of the crew of some of guys scallywag. Yeah, I think uh, it's a pretty tough leg, to be honest. Um, so much stuff happened. Like when people ask what are the tactical decisions, there's so many different things that happened that feels like it was five different legs, right down to the last 24 hours that felt like a leg in itself. So, uh, yeah, I think we, uh, you know, we had a little uh, bit of a bad roll at the beginning when we chose to dig north, but made the best of a bad position. And yeah, pretty pleased to come in second. Well, it seems to all be going in your favour since you jumped on the boat. Is that, is that the feeling on board? Everyone's feeling good about the current team set up? Yeah, I think it's, it's going well. And, you know, it's a, it's a team that's growing and learning all the time. And, uh, you know, very much last, last, to the, last to the start in terms of uh, experience on the boat and, uh, and development and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, every leg for us, we're just closing and closing. And, um, yeah, to hold on to some of the more established teams like Axon Oval. I mean, we had a full dogfight with them for... What well, feels like forever. It was a bit mind blowing. Well, congratulations. You guys deserve it. Well done. Thanks. Libby Greenhouse, there, the navigator on uh, Sunukai Scallywag. We're just watching Anamika Bess at the moment, just uh, talking to some of the reporters down on the, the dock. And uh, so, Conrad, we were talking a bit before. We, we just sort of uh, left the conversation to go to uh, the interview there with David Whip. But Missily, the owner of Sunungai Scallywag, uh, saw that we're doing well, flew over into Auckland to be there to the finish. But, you know, a little bit more than that, decided to actually sort of go via the boat on the water. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. I'm not exactly... <laughs> Uh, you know, do you have to be in first class, or do you actually need to be flying across the Atlantic, uh, across the Pacific, in uh, in the pilot seat to to make this call? But super impressive that they were able to get the plane to fly over the racing yacht as it was going down the coast, just by the Bay of Islands. That's pretty cool. And that's what I thought was so lovely when uh, David Witt there, just when he was being interviewed, said, "Oh yeah, I, I saw the flyover. Yeah. I was so nice. I mean, th this is a relationship that you don't see very often with a lot of the other teams. They're backed by commercial entities. They have commercial responsibilities, where Sunungai Scallywag, it's a privateer in the fleet. This is, a, this is an owner and a, and a racer and the friendship that they bring to it. It's, it's a little bit refreshing. Yeah, it's, it's really touching. You know, that uh, um, th This is a, a professional sport, you know, much in the same way as, uh, as, as Formula, Formula One and, and you know, in comparison with, with football even. You know, in football, you've got a big owner and, and you've got a very intimate relationship with the, uh, with the players directly. And, but that's very much a rarity here because you've got you know, corporate names on the side of all of these other boats. Uh, and it's, it's sort of really quite touching to see the relationship between, um, between David Witt and, um, and Mr. Lee. It's, it's, it's quite unique in the sport and uh, uh, sort of harkens back a little bit to the beginning uh, era of, of this race, you know, when you did have so many privateers in the race. Uh, well, you talk about early editions of the race, you talk, you know, legends of the race. I think Grant Dalton, you know, this is a big name. We're here in Auckland. I know you spoke to Grant Dalton yesterday, and we've been talking so much about just how exceptional this finish was to Auckland, but yesterday, talking to the big man himself, I think you were asking him some interesting questions about his favorite finishes. You've done this race six times, you've had some notable arrivals into Auckland, most notably, well, the one that, that springs to mind is, is Fisher and Paykel. Can you talk us through your, your favorite arrival in Auckland? It certainly wasn't Fisher and Paykel, Mark, I'm <laughs> second. Uh, but we, uh, the best one for me was, and you know they're all great, okay. Uh, I mean, my first one on fly when we were, when I was a crew when we were first in. I mean, that, now I won't forget that one either. But probably the 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 two that we won under here on Endeavour and then Merritt, probably those Endeavour, which was a very Kiwi boat. Second to the top of New Zealand off Cape Reinga, Endeavour. Dalton and Kevin Shoebridge show the stress of trying to be first into the hometown. Had a hell of a battle down the coast with um, Dixon. And he was a good villain in those days. So. It's a storybook ending to this leg as two local international sailing heroes are dueling to be first to arrive home. Subsequently, he's calmed down a bit. <laughs> and uh, we passed him. We, we finished about 2 o'clock in the morning. And we passed him inside North Head. So that's basically 
a kilometre from the finish. Into the mass of spectator boats whose running lights look like a blanket of stars. Ten miles away, Auckland glows like a colossal midway. Endeavour's light sails are ghosting her down the channel. Everybody says we turned our lights off, but there were so many lights, I don't think even if we had it would have made any difference. And I, they estimated that there was, this is two o'clock in the morning, there was quarter of a million people in the viaduct for that finish, and it was live on TV from quite a long way out. Into the flat still water, the smaller Tokyo is nearly stopped. And Endeavour keeps momentum and wins it. Tokyo just two minutes behind. There is nothing quite like an Auckland welcome to the Whitbread fleet. It's 3 a.m., 100,000 sailing fanatics cheer on the dramatic last moments. The jubilant celebration is unique. This has to be the city of sails. So that was just, that was an amazing, amazing return home. It was the most unbelievable uh, well, day, really, of our, most of our lives. Uh, you know, we were close all the time. We couldn't quite get there. We got really close to North Head. Mike and, and Glenn and the boys called some great tactics we got through. But also congratulations to Chris and the Tokyo crew. They're brilliant. They did an absolutely fantastic job and they easily could have been here. Probably of the of you know the, the six finishes I've done into Auckland, that would be the most memorable of the wins. Grant Dalton just explained to us why those finishes into Auckland get so memorable. It certainly does come down to the line. And not least in this edition of the Volvo Ocean Race, leg six came down to just a few miles, but not just for first second, indeed, for all the way back through the fleet. Mafre, 12 hours ago, 24 hours ago, they were completely dead and buried. 12 hours ago, they had half a hope. And then they managed to do it to, to t turn the tide on plastic, sailing round over the top of Di Cafari. They took third place and, I mean, really stole it just in those last few miles. A heartbreaking scenes for fans of Turn the Tide on Plastic, but it says what we've always been saying here. This boat, when they have open space around them, they are quick. And you need to be worried about them if they're breathing down your neck. Well, absolutely, and you know, it's, it's going to be incredible for the two Kiwi sailors on board. We've got Louis Sinclair and uh, and Blair Took uh, getting a nice, nice handshake there for, from part of his team. Um, you know, when I and maybe we'll, we'll play the rest of, of the interview a little bit, a little bit later on. But um, I, I talked with with Grant Dalton about this moment, and I, I said, you know. Did, whether he had a hand to play in getting Blair to onto this team, and he said no, absolutely not. He got got there on his own merits, having won the 49er World Championships, uh, you know, four years on the trot in the Olympics and the America's Cup and so on. And I actually said, you know, what is it going to be like for this guy here, who's used to being on the top step of the podium, to be out the back of the fleet? You know, maybe this is going to be a really big learning moment um, for him to figure out what the back end of the fleet looks like. But you know, just, just can't. Can't keep a good storyline going, thanks, uh, thanks Blair. You know, you've managed to get back into the front of the race, and uh, that's clearly where they're most comfortable. I mean, and for fans of Mafre, this will come as well, potentially no shock. I mean, a third place finish. If you just tuned into the race right now, and I told you that the overall race leader had finished in third place, you go, oh, well, that's nothing yeah. too spectacular. Sweet. But actually, 24 hours ago, this was unthinkable considering the miles that were involved. Yeah, it's so, so nice. And, and to see the fact, you know, sailors often stay in behind the guardrails, kind of like a wild animal at the zoo. And, and uh, you know, journalists go and, go and throw questions at sailors in much in the same way that you would otherwise throw peanuts at an animal on the zoo. But it's <laughs> awesome to see Blair too, you know, first guy off the boat on the dock, he's at home and he's immediately into the, into the arms um, of, of family and friends, you know, just, can't contain that, that passion of being back at home. And maybe he just really, really wants a clean shower. Or the loo. Or the loo, that's a very good point. We really don't know. We're gonna leave him to it, whatever it is that he needs. We are gonna stay with the boat and we are just waiting to hear from some of the sailors. There is the man of the hour, Shabby Fernandez, managed to get Mafre to sail over Xavi, the top of yeah, Turn the Tide of Plastic. Result. Let's hear what he has Since to say. You guys just finished the world's longest match race, some fierce racing out there. Can you talk us through that last 24 hours? How did you guys end up in third? Well, I don't really know yet, uh, but it's been crazy, crazy 20 days, 21 days, uh, just uh, match racing, as you say. 
very good first week, I think, uh, going north and taking the front, and then uh, things got very complicated, and we've been fighting, uh, of course, with Don Fen like crazy. And, you know, that's the, that's the world. We, we never stop, and we fought so hard, and uh, now we feel very happy, of course. So last time you came into Auckland, you said uh, that you were super happy, super, super, super happy. How's it feel right now? Well, pretty much the same, or even better, I think. Yeah, I think we had a, we were hoping for opportunities in the doldrums. We never came, and finally they came today, and, you know, we almost uh, could do anything. So very happy with the third of Well, from where you guys were to get up into third place deserves a huge congratulations. Well done, Jabi. Xavi Fernandez, skipper of Mafre with his crew. I mean, what you're seeing here, I mean, this is relief, really, because the, their main rivals were around them, Dongfeng Racing, Vesta Selemitar Racing, who are the next boat nearest to them on the podium. They're not on the water racing. They're going to rejoin, hopefully, uh, in time for the import race in Auckland. But they managed just to get those little few extra points just in the last few, uh, few hours. And how important is it for a team to learn those lessons that, you know what, guys, even if it seems insurmountable, got to keep pushing, you never know. Never, ever, ever give up. We've heard David Witt say that from the beginning, uh, and, and that's just how brutal ocean racing is, is that there are always, always opportunities out there on the line. And, you know, for those of you that, that sail at, at home, you know what this feels like, but, but maybe not over the course of a 6,000 mile leg. If you are in last place in the doldrums, you might think that you've got a whole 10 days of being in last place. And so, you know, you could you very easily imagine that, that, you know, your spirits lag, that you sort of let things slip. You say, oh, okay, well, you've just got to accept the inevitable. This is the way it's going to happen. But you've got to fight all the way to the finish line. And this is just proof, again, you know, of the, of the, the power of ocean racing. Uh, that attitude, you can't just leave out on the water. You've got to be able to bring it into your, into your daily life as well. Uh, but it's, it's just a message that the, um, that the ocean racing sailors can sort of teach all of us that uh, never, ever, ever give up and keep fighting to the line. And if there is one leg of this edition, uh, shall I say, so far, that has really hammered home that message, it has certainly been this one. I can't wait to see the timing split is going to come down to minutes or indeed just under between some of these boats. Dongfong race team, they crossed the line in fourth place. They are now reversing into the dock. All of this happening in the race village in Auckland, which will, it is open now and it will stay open uh, until the boats depart on the next leg of the race. If you've got the time, get yourself down there, go and take a look at the boats and the teams up close and personal. In, indeed, in some of the background of these shots, you can see the team bases. They're all there for you to, uh, well, pretty much in the same way that people go to the zoo. Glass walls all the way around. You can see the debriefs and the discussions that are happening. And now we are watching Dongfeng race team just reversing in. And this, you know, I, I'm going to pay homage here to Auckland, the city of sails. It's got a strong reputation for really loving its sailing. But, I mean, what time in the morning is it? And look at how many people there are out there. It's 2.30 in the morning, and you just can't keep a Kiwi down when it comes to enjoying a good bit of yachting. Uh, you know, and, and thank goodness for the Volvo Ocean Race, too. You know, they, clearly these guys are putting on an incredible show, squeaking in at the last minute and sort of keeping everybody on, on, uh, on tenterhooks all the way through. You know, it's just fantastic sailing. Um, but it's, it's so impressive. You know, the, Auckland is called the City of Sales, and it's because it has one of the highest boat ownerships per capita uh, ratios in the world. And frankly, if, when you're sailing, in, no, when you're driving across the harbour on the, on the Auckland Harbour Bridge, uh, any day of the week, you can look over your shoulder and down into the bay, and there are just so many yachts out there enjoying, uh, enjoying the conditions. And so um, that's why the, the arrivals into Auckland City have just always been so legendary. Not only because we've got those, cla those last minute finishes like we saw in the last video with Grant right, Dalton, um, but also First just because there are so many passionate fans. Can you talk to us about that finish? It was amazing out there. Uh, yes, we finished a big fight with uh, Turn the Tight and uh, Mab Frey, uh, very close. Very close to the shore, uh, just uh, at high speed. It was really nice in between the island. But uh, yes, sorry for turn the tide because they did a fantastic race. And <laughs> I think they deserve uh, the third place. But uh, that's selling. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was all to play for out there. And it was truly remarkable to watch you guys all coming down the coast. Now, you talked about the fact you didn't really like the food on board. What are you looking forward to now you're in New Zealand? 
Um, I don't know. I'm waiting for my first hamburger. <laughs> All right, there's lots of hamburgers and plenty of beers as well. So congratulations, mate. Well done. Oh, family reunited there. Charles Cordrelia, skipper of Dongfong Race Team. And rather beautiful scenes on board the boat here with families reunited, not just Charles. but rather special for all these sailors to come ashore. And, and Conrad, you know, one thing I'm noticing here, th th there's a lot of smiles. I mean, I know that we're seeing some magical moments Darryl, here. congratulations, we're parents Matt. being reunited, but Daryl Winslang as well, in back Zealand. into Auckland. Is Let's hear what he's got to say. Oh yeah, I mean, it's always nice coming in here, but um, obviously uh, the result, fourth, not, uh, not what we'd hoped for, but um, you know, six and a half thousand mile match race with uh, our friends next door here. Um, you know, it's uh, pretty intense racing. You also talked about how good is it to come home to the family. You got them with you now. How's that feel, Matt? Yeah, it's amazing. Um, you know, uh, I mean, look at them. How can you not love them? <laughs> Too true. Well, enjoy being home. It's thoroughly deserved. Cheers, Matt. <laughs> oh, are you getting wet too? Oh, hello. Oh, yeah. Well done, mate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Darryl, Darryl, Darryl Winslang. 36 years old, fifth Volvo Ocean race for this edition. Of course, won it with uh, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing. I and mean, he's, he's an impressive sign uh, for uh, a Dongfeng race team. And I just wonder whether we can have a look at some of the statistics here that have been coming off from this leg. We had a look earlier between first and second. Now let's go for Dongfeng race team and uh, Mafre and have a little bit of a look at some of the numbers here. These, again, two teams that were locked side by side. When it comes down to distance sales, the thing that really jumps out here is the fact that you've got 6,200 miles sailed and only 20 miles difference between these two boats. They were you know, stuck with super glue all the way through. And all the way through, right the way to the end. I mean, average speed, uh, best 24 hour distance, very, very, very similar. And this just goes to show that we have got a real race on. Mafre had that early punch in the first couple of legs. They got a few points. The Donfron race team w weren't quite able to match them. Now, certainly looking at these numbers at least and what we've just saw in the water over the last 24 hours, it's going to be bout to bout. Yeah, it is. But one of the things that, sorry, just the numbers have gone away now, but I'd like to re refer us to the, the numbers that were down in the bottom left-hand corner. And that is, uh, Dongfong race team 61, Mafre 77. If you can remember, you know, Cast your memory back to leg three when we were down in the Indian Ocean. And we saw so many more jibes down by the ice barrier mm. of Mafre versus, versus Dongfong race team. And this was, we, we saw between the two red boats that Mafre was just able to completely outwork all of the boats around them. And so there are more squiggles in the route of, of Mafre than in any other team. And so, yes, things are getting tighter at the top, <laughs> it's, it's really impressive to see. But the thing that just blows my mind is the fact that Mafre outworks every other boat. And I think that that is their crucial advantage, is that they're more prepared. Maybe it comes down to physical preparation or mental preparation. Uh, but I think that that is an edge that they can carry potentially all the way through to the end. And so they work harder, but also, crucially, we haven't seen Mafre make any major crew changes at all. Certainly in the last leg, the leg before, no crew changes at all. Yep. This is a boat that has been sailing incredibly well right from the start, and leg six, well, I mean, it didn't quite go their way in the middle, but they pushed hard. Nice to be underway, and um, yeah, it's a great stop over in Hong Kong, but we're, we're trying to do it through, um, uh, Feels like back, back home now, back on the boat, it's all good. You want to me? What have I got to lose? We're a catastrophe. We left Hong Kong and it was basically hard on the wind as expected up to the corner of Taiwan, which is just seen in the background now. You took me to the moon. You were the strength I needed. Why did it end so soon? As everyone is expecting, they uh, getting uh, very close to the top ten and, and fighting since the start. It's a lot, to, a lot to go and a lot of mistakes to do, so hopefully we can keep it together and try to take our opportunities. Hong Kong's 
directly behind us about five miles so it's been pretty pleasing we're going well on those guys um, speed wise which is nice Currently got a um, Dong Fong sort of up to wind about one mile and a half. Uh. We are officially last. Secret Mepre weapon. Chabi. Chabi is a secret weapon. Hopefully we can have a chance to get in front of Brunel at some point. So I think anything can happen, you know. Anything's possible. Anything's possible, and indeed, they certainly did surprise a lot of people. Not least, turn the tide on plastic and Di Kafari, who will be next coming into the dock. Unbelievable series of finishes that we have seen so far. And Dong Fong race team on the dock as well. And we're just seeing Turn the Tide on Plastic coming in in the background. And uh, everything happening so fast here in Auckland. We do have one boat still out on the water, Team Brunel, who really slipped off the pace just by New Caledonia. But Turn the Tide on Plastic is the next boat coming in and Conrad, for fans of this boat, this is going to be a little bit of a difficult moment. And seeing the look on this, uh, the, the, the faces of these sailors as they come in here, this is going to be a little bit difficult for everybody. Well, yes, yes, for sure. But you know, I think one of the things that we can count on is the fact that Deke Farrier is going to be smiling through this. You know, she's got. You should know this better than anybody. You know her pretty well, but also you share that British stiff upper lip, don't you, Niall? <laughs> well, I'd like to think so, but I, I, I think in this situation, when I had just done 5,600 miles of just the hardest graft, the, the, the heat and the drifting around and the concentration needed to lose it in the last, what, 10, 20, 30 miles. Yeah, for, for sure. No, I, I'm, I'm joking, but we can't sugarcoat this. You know, this is going to suck for any team. Uh, that, you know, that remember, this is a team of, of, of youngsters uh, that were relatively new when it comes to offshore racing, but they are Olympians, they're America's Cup sailors, they are Figaro sailors, champions, all in their respective disciplines. And so, you know, as they've gone their way around the world, they've always been in last place, and that, is, and that has been a tough pill to swallow. And now they're starting to get, uh, to get some results coming through. Uh, they've shown the fact that they can compete, uh, this, is, this was their best leg ever so far, and yet they don't really get to enjoy it on the scoreboard. And, but they have earned the respect of their competitors. I mean, it was interesting to hear Charles Cordrelia when we spoke to him when he crossed the finish line, he said it's re it was really tough sailing past D. You know, they, they managed to sail past him, but they didn't enjoy it. You know? They felt bad for, for their fellow competitor, and I think that speaks volume to how well this boat has shown everybody. They're not just here to make up the numbers. They're not just here to have a logo on the side. They're doing good things environmentally and with their corporate message. But they're doing but, great things on the race course. Absolutely, and I think that's the thing. They are not a boat that you can be next to and you can think, well, this is fine. Just let the clock tick down and we'll be ahead of them. Because that's not the way that it went on this leg. Indeed, we've got to be fair here, Dongfeng race team and Mafre did not have the the difficult breeze challenges that turned the tide on plastic face in the northern end of New Zealand. And that really closed the gauge. And from there, it just managed to tick over the top of them before they got to the finish line. Yeah, so Henry Bombi there to uh, sort of welcome friends and, friends and family. His girlfriend is a school teacher back in England is not able to, to welcome him on the pontoon the, this morning, sadly. But regarding this team, the way that they've put, put it together, I think that there's one thing that's really smart here with um, with Dee Kafari is that she's got Brian Thompson bringing a lot of experience offshore, uh, and but also Nico Linvin. So he has been navigating in the early stages of this race, and and, and Brian has been sort of helping out in, in prepping the prepping the legs and so on. But because he had a broken leg, he couldn't sail. Now Brian was on board for the last leg. He was the, the sole navigator, but Nico came back on board, and the two of them sailed together, and 
together, they were able to put together a great strategy on the, on the water. Of turn the tide on plastic. D, you guys have sailed such an amazing race, and in the end, those red boats just caught you. Heartbreaking for us on shore. How was it on board the boat? Uh, we're pretty good, and um, you can tell by the fact that nobody stood along the deck. Um, I don't actually even know what to say. Gutted. Well, we're all gutted for you. You guys have sailed so well. Surely you take some momentum going forward, knowing that you can really keep up with those front boats. Yeah, I mean, we had a good race, and uh, we thought we were going to have a better result. Um, but those pesky red boats always seem to get it their way. Absolutely. Well, I won't hold you. You guys sailed a good race, and uh, you should be proud of yourselves. Well done. All right, ladies and gents, let's give it up for hometown hero, Bianca Cook. Well done. Congratulations, Bianca. You talked about when you were growing up how you used to watch the Volvo boats come in. Obviously not the result you would have wanted, but how did it feel coming into your home port? Uh, it was uh, pretty tough, uh, pretty close going. Um, those guys just managed to get us just at the end, but it was uh, pretty incredible. Breeze really filled in and, you know, we didn't quite get the result that we wanted, but we did really well as a team. And, uh, yeah, welcome to New Zealand, guys. <laughs> Yeah, well, absolutely. Welcome to New Zealand. I won't keep you. Go say hi to those friends and family. Ladies and gentlemen, our hometown hero, Bianca Cook. Thank you. <laughs> One more time, ladies and gentlemen. Bianca Cook, straight into the arms of family and Conrad. I mean, it, it, not only for fans of the boat, but any boat that works really hard and arguably, you could say, deserves the position that they've sailed themselves into. Then to have it sort of taken away from him. And it, you know, I, like you said, I have, I have met Dee before, but I, all of us, you can see it in Dee's character. She doesn't particularly want sympathy. She wants to be given a, a fair course, a fair runway and a fair sort of crack of the whip. Yep. They will absolutely be back on the next leg. Um, but it's difficult, I think, for, for friends when you've, been, when you've been waiting for the team to find their form. They found it and then it was just a bit cruel at the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, it's brutal. And, um, you know, I, I don't, don't want to be mean to the, um, to the presenter on, on, the, on the pontoon there, but uh, it, it does sort of drive the knife just in a little bit deeper when you say, you know, well done, you played with the big boys, but then you ended up where you deserve. Um, or at, at the back where, where you're most familiar. Um, so, so, yeah, sort of mi mixed emotions that uh, on, on one side, you know, it's going to be a, a, a good debrief on the fact that they, they put so many things together really, really well on this leg. They were favoured by the fact that, um, you know, no really strong conditions. There was relatively flat water leg. There were no big surfs. Uh, the, the team that is relatively new on this kind of boat was able to perform at their best because they could focus just on, on speed and performance rather than trying to survive down in the brutal conditions of the Southern Ocean. Um, so, so in many ways, this was their leg. And, and, and it's a score that does not reflect how hard this boat has worked and how, how far towards the lead. I mean, leading the fleet at times during this leg, pushing really hard, outpacing their nearest rivals. And at this time, it's, it is unpalatable for the crew to have to be thinking about, let's take away the positives. You want to reflect on the fact that we didn't get the result that we wanted. We worked really hard. However, uh, some key, some good moments to take away, not least captured by the onboard reporter, James Blake, uh, somebody, the, the, the son of Sir Peter Blake, a huge Kiwi legend. And they're sharing a moment with, with Dee Kafari, special for so many people on this boat to step off. It really has been a very tough end to what was a fantastic performance out on the water on leg six for Turn the Tide on Plastic. We had a bit of a shocker, not 
no pace on the start, but you can see the fleet's already about a mile ahead. So we've got a bit of catching up to do, but that's what we do best. Everyone here is all smiles. Everyone is soaking wet inside and out. We're all smiles because it's really, really fast sailing, which is fab after a long, slow upwind slog. Everyone's pretty happy about it. We got 30 knots, we got the J0 up. Cross there we had with Brunel, we just sort of snuck out of that light wind patch into some breeze and then we got a good shift so we decided to tack. I'm pretty excited about sailing into New Zealand. Turn the tide on plastic, their leg is now over. They did not finish in the position that well, many of us would argue they deserve. But this is a team that is here to race and here to compete. And this is what they're competing for, the results from leg six. We're still waiting for Team Brunel to cross the finish line, but being the only boat still out in the water, we can be fairly confident that this is what the points are going to be. It will be full eight, seven for their position, and then a bonus point for the leg win. They will take eight, Team Axanabel, and then Team Sun Hong Kai Saliwag just behind them take six. And then it gets interesting. Mafre, Dong Frong, a little bit further down. Well, Charlie Enright will not be thanking uh, the fact that my friend Dongfeng Race Team managed to squeak ahead of Brunel and turn the tide on plastic because getting those two red boats back up into the top half of that fleet, well, you can see what it does in the overall here. It secures their position at the, in the first and second. Mafre and Dongfeng Race Team with now five points between them. That extra, that extra point by, uh, by Mafre, even though they didn't get the bonus point on the, uh, on the leg that would have really sort of knocked it out of the park, they did finish one up on Dongfeng Race Team. But check out third place. David Witt there, he's gonna have a smile on his face sitting pretty in third place. And Team Axel Nobel in fourth, but tied on points with Vessus 11th Hour Racing, the tie being broken on the results for the import racing, Vessus 11th Hour Racing, missing the import racing in Hong Kong, Guangzhou. So that has hurt them in this instance, but Vessus 11th Hour Racing repairing the boat. The last thing that we heard was the bow repairs going well. So fingers crossed, we're gonna see that team back on the water before the import racing in Auckland. And indeed, uh, the team should be with us in an update over the next few weeks, all going well. <sighs> what an unbelievable arrivals. We knew that this was going to be close. I mean, 24 hours ago, we thought the story was done and dusted and we were repairing, preparing our numbers. This is probably what the overall scoreboard were going to look like. Check then that it, out the window. It yeah. all <laughs> changed. And absolutely, we've had highs, we've had lows. I think the fans of the race have had a little bit of everything. We still have Team Brunel out on the water. And this is one boat, we talk about the cruelty to turn the tide on plastic. Let's not forget Team Brunel leading early on in this leg and leading well with good pace, then it evaporated. Well, well, yes, but, but to be fair, they, they took a pretty ballsy gamble down by New Caledonia. They were in fourth place, but still in connection with leaders, and they decided to really go with a, quite, a, quite a bizarre move. You know, that the, the, these Volvo Ocean 65 boats, they go so much faster downwind than they do upwind. And, and when they went into stealth mode, they said, you know, they were all full of vim and vigor. They said, all right, here, we're gonna try something different. But, you know, just the physics are against them. It went against them, and ahead of them was Dongfeng Race Team that finished, but a huge distance between these two and we are waiting for Team Brunel to finish. That's gonna be in a little while, but Dongfong Race Team, the boat ahead of them, crossed the finish line. They have been 
duking it out with Mafre, locked horns early on and stayed with the overall leaders, refusing to let them out of their sight. Something they did very early on in leg six all the way through to the finish. We're gonna take a little bit of a break while we wait for Team Brunel to get a little bit closer to the finish line. We're gonna leave you with the highlights of the leg through the eyes of Dongfeng Racing. We get to get to uh, open. <laughs> At the end of the night, we had a front to go through. That's why we've been uh, we've been going northeast uh, for uh, now since uh, the start. Completely opposite direction of uh, where we want to go. So not at the good position. I think we should be more east. Now we have the forecast and uh, we can see that we are in good position. But uh, Mapre uh, still uh, here, very close, and still fighting for the first place. But uh, the fleet is very close, so long way. <laughs> quite, uh, quite nice conditions, a little bit unstable, but um, yeah, traveling in the right direction now. We split stack tacks with the other red boats. The bungee has snapped between us. We'll stick to our plan from now on and um, see how we go, see if we can catch the others now. Mefre right here, one mile away. You want me to do a bloody hat trick? <laughs> 